If you would grab your Bible and turn to uh, Prophet Obadiah, back there where the pages stick together, that's one of the reasons why we're covering this series in the Minor Prophets, uh, minor because the books are shorter, not because they're less significant. Um, but it's the 12 Minor Prophets, and we're looking at their message, and we're taking a, a book at a time. So today we're looking at Obadiah. We've already looked at Hosea and Joel and Amos. And we'll move on through this series till we finish those 12 uh, smaller prophetic books. This is a serious topic today because we're talking about God's justice. And uh, God who is all-knowing and all-powerful cannot do less than what is just. He sometimes does better for us than justice in giving us mercy and grace, um, but he cannot do less than that. So we're going we're gonna to look at that. And the theme of the book of Obadiah is that God restores hope for us because of his justice. His justice is what gives us hope to move on when we've been wounded. And so he speaks to the nation of Israel, and it's recorded for our benefit. The theme is picked up in the New Testament. So we're going to kind of put all of that together. How does God restore hope when we've been wounded? Well, all of us have been wounded in some way. Don't raise your hand, but... uh, If you've been betrayed, this message is for you. If someone has taken your trust and misused it, if you look back in hindsight and you realize, I never should have trusted that person, maybe I shouldn't have trusted them with this thing, maybe I shouldn't have trusted them, period, but they used it against you, then this book speaks to your situation. Because that is the situation that the prophet Obadiah is speaking to with the people of Judah, the southern part of the kingdom of Israel. When we're betrayed, trust is a part of that. You can't be betrayed by someone you've never trusted. They could wound you, but they can't betray you. Betrayal is worse in the sense that you did trust them, and then they broke a promise, they violated something that was an obligation that they had to you. Um, It may be that you trusted someone with something close to your heart. You shared some information that was very personal with someone you thought you could trust. And then you found out that many other people heard the same thing from them and it's become part of the gossip chain. Maybe the situation is you trusted somebody with something. You you gave them access to money or possessions or something that was important to you and you entrusted it to them, you expected that they would treat it as if it were important to you and that didn't happen. You loaned them something, you gave them something, you helped them out in some way and they just took advantage of you. They betrayed your trust. There's a spectrum of the kind of betrayal we experience. So there's smaller things where someone has misused information or misused something you entrusted to them. And then there's the shattering kinds of betrayal where trust in a marriage covenant is broken. And we're all somewhere on that spectrum. If you're past the ages of three or four, someone has misused your trust. And some are way over here where the wounds are are traumatically deep. But Obadiah speaks to that. In fact, he speaks to a significant betrayal of trust. He speaks to that not just because trust was broken, but because of what happens to us when we get betrayed. There's an emotional response when someone has betrayed you. And lots of things happen, but you may know that it's more difficult to trust other people. If someone else betrays you, the next person who is kind to you, now suddenly you begin to question, what is it they want? Are, are they too using me? We can become cynical. We can become people who feel like it's safer just not to trust. We sort of pull in the walls and we build them up high and we guard our own hearts and we close people off and we don't let them in. But that causes a second kind of injury. When you lock people out so they can't hurt you, you also lock them out so they can't love you. I mean, they might try, but you don't let them in close enough that you experience their love. In addition to that, the same walls that keep the love of people out also push us away from God. We're wired as human beings to be relational, to actually need to experience love. Love from God and love from some other people. That's a part of what it means to be human, to need that. And when we've been wounded, when we've been betrayed, we can push that away 
and do further damage to ourselves because we're unwilling to trust, we don't let people close, we push them away, and we keep them at a distance. The prophet Obadiah speaks a truth we need to hear when we've been wounded by someone who's betrayed our trust. And so he gives us a reason to have hope in a God who's bigger than all of that, a God who misses nothing, and he's going to help us see together as he speaks to the nation of Israel that God sees everything that's ever been done to us and ever will be done. He sees both good and evil. He's a God of absolute, perfect, and powerful justice. And because he is, in his very nature, a God who is just, he acts to bring justice. And that frees us up to choose to trust that rather than figuring out how to settle the score. So he offers us hope that, that we could be freed from bondage to someone who betrayed us and wounded us and having to figure out how to make that right and just simply say, God, that's now your problem. So let's, let's take a look at that. Because the major purpose of Obadiah is to breathe hope into hearts that have forgotten how to hope that have been so wounded that they've despaired and collapsed in on themselves and built the walls and hunkered down and said, we just have to grit it out for the rest of our days. And God says, not true. There's hope for you. There's hope for us. So prophet Obadiah begins his judgment, his prophecy of judgment. This is what the Lord God has said about Edom. And on first reading, what does that have to do with me? How does this relate? When you read through the book of Obadiah, it just sounds like judgment on a nation that no longer exists. But in order for us to understand what God is saying and why he's saying it, we need to pick up what the first readers already knew. The nation of Edom are descendants of Esau. So Abraham's grandsons are Jacob and Esau. They're twins. Esau is moments older than Jacob. And they have this conflicted relationship all of their years. If you attended Sunday school as a kid, you probably heard the story of Esau, who's the heir, who has the birthright, who on a day when he was exceedingly hungry, sold it for, sold it for a bowl of soup or stew. And Jacob and Esau have that kind of relationship. How can I get from you what I want that you have? How can I get that back from you? And it extends there's hatred and animosity. Jacob ends, fleeing, ends up fleeing for his life. As old men, there's reconciliation, but they're the founders. Jacob's in the line, but Esau is the founder of the nation of Edom, and Jacob is a part of the nation of Israel. And Obadiah picks up those two ideas. So he pronounces judgment against the nation of Edom, but in verse 6... He uses the word Esau, how Esau will be pillaged. And then further on down in verses 8 and 9, he uses Edom and Esau in the same way. And then in verse 10, you'll be covered with shame and destroyed forever because of the violence done to your brother Jacob. And it's that relationship of two nations that are cousins. They're ancestors were brothers, and as nations, they consider themselves relatives. And it's in a Middle Eastern culture that's an honor-shame culture. You do certain things so that people will respect you, so you'll be honored. If you violate those responsibilities, then you are publicly shamed by your entire family, clan, tribe, and nation. And God says, you violated a responsibility, a family responsibility, and he holds them accountable for that. So how does Obadiah restore hope? Well, look, we'll begin in the middle, go back to the beginning, and then finish up. In the middle of the book, God enumerates the sins that the people of Esau, the nation of Edom, had committed against his own people, the people of Jacob or Judah, southern Israel. And he, as he enumerates them, he's telling us, I saw everything that was done. He gives details. This happened. You should have done this, but you did that. You had an obligation here, and you violated it in this way. Verse 10, you'll be covered with shame 
and destroyed forever because of the violence done to your brother Jacob. On the day you stood aloof, on the day strangers captured his wealth, while foreigners entered the city gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were just like one of them. And the event he is recounting is when Babylon swept in and laid siege to the city of Jerusalem in 585 B.C. And Obadiah is writing sometime after that, and he is recounting what happened. And on that day, the nation of Edom did the next things. Now, in this passage, there's stated sort of a, a prophetic way of speaking. You should not have done these things. You had an obligation not to do them, but they're already past tense. They've already been done. Do not gloat, or you could read it, you should not have gloated over your brother in the day of his calamity, verse 11. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction. Do not boastfully mock or scornfully mock or arrogantly mock them in the day of their distress. Do not enter my people's city gate in the day of their disaster. Yes, you do not gloat over their misery in the day of their disaster. Do not appropriate their possessions in the day of their disaster. As Babylon swept in and laid siege to the capital, the city of Jerusalem, the Edomites, the next country over, said, here's our chance. We can go pillage our own cousins. And they attacked other cities and broke down the walls and took possessions. They laughed and mocked at Israel's disaster. But it gets worse. And here's where God's judgment is kindled against the nation of Edom. And do not, verse 14, stand at the crossroads and cut off, it's a metaphor, to kill, to murder the fugitives, the refugees. And do not hand over their survivors into slavery in the day of their distress. So it's a nation that are cousins to the people of Israel that came in and pillaged their cities when Israel was attacked and the army was tied up trying to defend Jerusalem. And they took their possessions and they slaughtered their people and the ones they didn't kill they sold into slavery in Babylon. And God says to the nation of Israel, and he's speaking about Edom to the people of Israel, I saw everything they did to you. Now, I need to tell you that the book of Obadiah does not tell us why God didn't intervene. And it doesn't tell us why God didn't intervene because Hosea and Joel and Amos have already given us that information. The nation of Israel said, yes, you're the God who led us out of Egypt, but we're tired of you. We're going to create our own gods, and we're going to worship them. And when they chose not to worship the one true God, they also chose to step out from under Almighty God's protection. It was their choice to reject God's love and God's worship and God's provision and God's protection. And they're experiencing the consequences as Babylon comes, destroys their capital, and takes them captive. But Edom decided to pile on, and for that, God says, I'm holding you accountable for your wicked behavior when your cousins were suffering. God declares, I know exactly what occurred. God is a God who is absolutely just. He may do better than justice in extending mercy, but he never, ever is less than just. He doesn't excuse guilt. Instead, he chooses to forgive it, and we'll see that in a little bit. Obadiah says to the nation of Israel, God saw everything that was done. Jesus picks up on that theme, not talking about the nation of Israel, but talking about God's perfect and complete knowledge. In Matthew 12, he says he knows every single word we've ever said and will be accountable even for our idle words. I don't know how it works for women, but I know as men that there's an idle gear for your brain. We have the ability to just put our minds in neutral and not think about stuff. And sometimes we don't forget to shift it back into gear before we start talking. And so sometimes we end up with words that are not well considered. 
And God says, I, I hear those words, and I'll hold you accountable for those words. So that's Jesus, Matthew 12. Second Corinthians talks about God comforting us in our distress. If we're his followers, when we suffer, God provides comfort. That means he knows how we're suffering. He knows how to provide the comfort in that moment. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, talks about nothing in all creation is hidden from God. He sees everything. He sees the actions and he sees the intentions, the motives of the heart. But in the book of Hebrews, we learn something that isn't covered in the Old Testament. Up until this point, Jesus' statement in Matthew 12, 2 Corinthians, and Hebrews 4, earlier than verse 15, God has told us he knows perfectly, but in the New Testament we discover in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, that God not only knows intellectually, but he knows experientially. That Jesus came and did something that wasn't true before he did it. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but, or instead, we have one who's been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And that passage tells us Jesus knows what it feels like to be hungry and tired, to work to exhaustion. He knows what it's like to be hot and too hot or too cold and to suffer. Sometimes people refer to Jesus as a carpenter, but in first century Israel, it's really a stonemason. Almost all the construction is with stone. And if you work with stone long enough, sooner or later, you're going to smash some part of your body. Right? That the chisel's going to fly or the, the hammer's going to bounce off of something and land on your thumb. Jesus has been there. He's experienced those kinds of everyday pains. But this passage tells us more than that. He's experienced the difficulty and the intense pressure of temptation to a greater degree than we possibly can. None of us have or ever will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan for three rounds. But Jesus did. At his weakest moment, Satan shows up to tempt him three different ways. And in none of those temptations did Jesus cave in. In addition to that, Jesus has experienced betrayal to a degree that you and I have not. Because the betrayal he experienced was pouring his life into 12 disciples and then having one of them sell him out to be crucified for the price of a slave. So God not only knows what we've experienced, but he's been there in similar situations. Now the great news in this passage is God doesn't just say to us, I feel your pain. I know what that feels like. He goes well beyond that. He goes on to say, and I will act to bring justice where injustice was done. I will act to make right what was made wrong. God delights in mercy, but when he extends mercy, he does not violate justice. So go back to the beginning of Obadiah. He pronounces judgment on them, and the whole book is a message of judgment on the people of Edom. You've heard a message from the Lord, verse 1, an envoy has been sent among the nations, rise up, let us go, go to war against Edom. And then he gives some detail about their attitude, verse 3, your arrogant heart has deceived you who lived in the clefts of the rock and made your home in the heights, who say to yourself, who can bring us down to the ground? Though you seem to soar like an eagle and make your nest among the stars, even there I will bring you down. This is the Lord's declaration. And the nation of Edom had built their city in rock clefts and on the top of escarpments, and they felt like, we, we have this impregnable fortress. No one can conquer us. And God says, that may be true for human armies, but you're up against the creator of the universe. And the nation of Edom no longer exists. God's justice was executed on them fairly shortly after Obadiah gave the prophecy. God did execute justice on those who made themselves his enemy. Now, 
That's not God's heart desire. God much prefers to extend mercy. That's why Jesus came to earth. He said in John chapter 3, God loved the world so much that he sent his only one son, referring to himself, so that no one would have to perish. No one would have to endure God's justice for eternity. Instead, we can have life that's eternal if we'll simply put our trust in him. It goes on in verse 18 to say, if we've rejected the one way God has made for us to connect with himself, then we deserve what we will get. We're all guilty before God, and what we deserve is justice. What he offers is mercy if we'll simply trust in Jesus who came to save us. In the book of Obadiah, he begins with judgment on the nation of Edom. He lists exactly the evils that they did to their cousins, the people of Israel. But then in verse 15, he broadens out the lens. He zooms back and says, actually, I'm going to bring justice on all nations. Look at that with me. For the day of the Lord is near against all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. What you deserve will return on your own head. As you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and gulp down as though they had never been. They will experience God's wrath and God's judgment. Why? Because they acted against God's own people. So it starts with this specific nation of Edom, zooms out to all the nations. There will be justice for all. Obadiah restores hope because God saw the sin, the offenses that were committed, and he details them. And then he says, and I am bringing justice. And we now know that justice was complete. He erased the nation of Edom. And then he predicts one day justice will be done throughout the earth. In fact, he goes beyond that. This all-powerful God will one day conclude history. So from the nation of Edom to all the nations to a point yet future, the end of the ver passage, the very last verse, saviors or those who are, have been saved will ascend Mount Zion and rule over the hill country of Esau. But the kingdom will be the Lord's. And if you look carefully at the last words in that verse, you'll see that Lord is in all capitals. It's a way in our English Bibles of signaling that this is God's memorial name in the original language. In, in Hebrew, this is Yahweh, the one God who always exists. God of all power and might and justice. And he and he alone will be the one who sits on the throne in Jerusalem. And now we know, because of who Jesus is and what he's done, that he will be the one who descends and sits upon the throne in Jerusalem. This is after the day of the Lord. After evil is eliminated from our experience, God himself will be the king of those who are his people. And as followers of Christ, we can be included in that. And that frees us from being people who have to settle the score now, who have to take our own revenge. We're invited to do something different. We can simply entrust justice to God, and that's what forgiveness is. And the moment I say the word forgiveness, because we speak English, we have freighted into that word some ideas that do not belong in the biblical word forgiveness. Raise your hand if you've heard someone say, well, forgive and forget. Okay, those are two entirely different concepts not connected to each other. In fact, let me suggest, if you could forget, you don't have to forgive. Right? If you're able to no longer remember that event and it no longer bothers you, then you, there's no need to forgive it. Just grow up and forget what was done. Somebody took the last bowl of cereal. So what? Have toast. Move on. But if you have to forgive it, it's bigger than you can forget. Forgiveness in an emotional and spiritual sense works a little bit like healing in a physical sense. A lot of us in this room have scars. I know if you're a guy, 
You have many of them, and you can probably remember how you got them. Hopefully they've healed, but that scar, you can't forget that you have it. Every time you see it, it's obvious, and you can remember how you got it. It's jumping your bike across the ditch when you were eight and you didn't make it, and now you've got scars to prove it. Forgiveness heals the scar and heals the wound, but you can't forget what was done. And God doesn't forget. In fact, one of the fallacies, I've even heard people say, well, God forgets. Well, the Bible uses the word forget, but it doesn't mean forget the way we mean forget. You and I legitimately cannot recall things. Scientists tell us everything you've ever seen, heard, experienced, smelled is all stored in your brain, but you lose the address. You can't retrieve it. It's in there somewhere, but you can't get it back. God doesn't suffer from that. He can't erase from his all-perfect knowledge some pieces of it. When he says, I forget your sins, what he means is, I won't hold you accountable. I know you did them. My son suffered for them. But I won't make you pay because he paid in your place. Pastor Dave read a couple of weeks ago the verse that's most quoted in the Bible by the Bible where God repeats himself over and over and over again. And if you've ever taken a class when the teacher or professor repeats himself, he or she is saying, this will be on the final. Take notes. Pay attention. This is important. And that passage brings two things together that we didn't know how went together until Jesus came. So let's take a look at that. Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. The Lord, the Lord is compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but he will not leave the guilty unpunished. How can God be just and forgive guilty people? No one knew until Jesus came. Now, it's fine if you're the one who's guilty and God says, okay, you're forgiven. You don't ask, how could you do this? I don't deserve that. You just say, okay, great. But when someone has sinned against you and God says to them they're forgiven, that question is the very first question you want to raise your hand and ask God. Wait a second. They sinned against me. How are you forgiving them? That's not fair. And we didn't know how that worked until Jesus came. And he went to the cross to pay the penalty to endure justice for all who were guilty. And everyone's guilt was placed on God the Son, and he endured the justice and the wrath of God for all guilty people. And he extends to us a pardon if we'll simply put our trust in him and accept what he offers. Jesus Christ paid for the sins of all of us in this room and everyone who has acted evilly against us. And the only question that really matters is how have we responded to God's offer of forgiveness? See, the sin will be paid for. Either Jesus took our place and paid for our sins or we'll pay for it ourselves forever. Well, the only two choices. As we look at how do we put into practice and experience the hope God offers, we need to move to the New Testament because it's in Obadiah, but the, the details are not clear enough for us to see them the way we can in the New Testament. So if you would turn with me to the book of Romans, we're going to see how the hope God supplies allows us to be people who entrust justice to him which is what forgiveness really means. In Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 17, we read these words. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it is written, vengeance belongs to me I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. 
If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you'll be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but instead conquer evil with good. So how do we do that? How do we rest in God's justice instead of attempting to take our own revenge? Or another way, how do we really forgive and let God do what only he can with the offenses committed against us? Well, there are three key steps, and the first one is that we're honest about what was done to us. We name the sin. Notice in verse 17, do not return evil for what? Evil that was done to you. God names it. When that person sinned against you, when they betrayed you, when they broke their promise, when they hurt you, when they took your stuff, when they damaged someone you loved, that was a sin. You and I kind of inherited a culture that says we should minimize that. We should excuse it. We should say it doesn't matter. And God says, wrong. It matters. You're my child and I love you and this was evil. And my son had to die for that sin. So name it as a sin. Now that doesn't mean you go to the person and you shake them by the lapels and you demand that they see it as a sin. Many times that person who's offended you, betrayed you, their conscience is seared enough, they just don't care. But you've got to be honest with yourself and honest with God. Notice in Obadiah, as we went through verses 10 through 14, the nation of Edom, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this. God is speaking to the people of Jerusalem about the nation of Edom. I know what was done to you, and he names those sins. first step really in forgiving someone else is being honest with yourself and with God about the sin that was committed against you. God is a God who always speaks the truth. We're instructed if we're his followers in the book of Ephesians to speak the truth in love, to not minimize or shade or try to whitewash what was done to us. If we're going to forgive something, we need to be honest about what was done. That's the first key step. Verse 19, and there's two pieces to this concept, so stay with me. In verse 19, friends, do not avenge yourselves. He's not stopping there, but we will for a moment. As beings created in God's image, there is a, a thread within us that is a reflection of God's justice. So let's put it out there for a second. If you are a good-hearted person and you see someone mistreating a child, isn't there something that rises up within you that says, that's wrong. If I could stop that, I would. That's a reflection of God's character. You see injustice being done. You see evil taking place. Something within you should respond to that. That you may not be in a situation where you can do something. It may not be safe for you to do something. But God's never in those situations. So that's a reflection of God's character. When it is injustice done to us, that's still true, but sometimes it gets a little twisted by selfishness. And we want justice to be done. That's a godly thing. When we take it into our own hands, it very quickly becomes an ungodly thing. That's why in verse 17, don't return evil for evil. Why? Well, because you and I won't always act justly. Many of the things we've experienced, someone has wronged us in a way that can't be fixed. So if you entrust truth to someone and they use it as gossip, you can't undo that. I mean, how would you? Go around in a race, mind wipe all the people that heard the thing that shouldn't have heard it? You can't fix it. Someone damages a covenant with you, you can't undo it. There's no word unbetray. There's just things can't happen. Not only can we not undo it, if we were to settle the score, most of the time we wouldn't settle for parity. We would one-up that person. You did this to me, I'm doing twice as much to you. And God knows that about us. He knows we don't have the ability to fix things that are beyond human ability to fix. And if we went to settle the score, we wouldn't settle it. We'd get into the whirlpool of a vicious cycle of, you did this to me, I'll do this back to you. Well, I'm doing more to you, and then I'll do more in response. So he just tells us, don't get on that merry-go-round. Instead, and here's his promise, 
Don't take your own revenge. Instead, leave room for God's wrath. Wrath here is an expression of God's justice. Let God take justice. Let him be the one who settles the score and repays the evil. He goes on to say, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay. Justice will be done. Now, he doesn't promise in every situation justice will happen 37 seconds after the offense. He doesn't promise justice will happen even in your lifetime. He doesn't promise justice will be happen, the, happen the way you think it ought to happen. He simply says, look, you can trust me. I'm a God who is always just. I never do less than justice. I may extend mercy where it's not deserved, just like I have to you. There won't be any person who stands before God in eternity who's rejected his son who can argue with God about the justice of their sentence. When you're before an infinitely knowledgeable, infinitely powerful being, and he says, here are all the things you've done, there's the consequence. And everyone will have to say, I don't like it, but you're right. And all of us who've been forgiven because Jesus took our place, we won't say, wait a second, you forgave someone else, we will be focused on, I don't deserve admission into heaven, but Jesus made it possible. It is not right that God the Son should have died for my sin. But because of his great love for me, he chose to do that. That'll be the one truth that overwhelms everything else we're thinking about. So how do you, how do you put this into practice? If someone has wounded you, you need to be honest with yourself and honest with God about what was done to you. That is the first step. Don't skip that. God, you know, you saw, you observed what was done to me when this happened. When those words were said, when this action was taken, when my trust was broken. And not taking revenge has got to relinquish the right to try to settle that score. That is now your problem. And I'm pushing that onto your side of the table and I'm backing away. If you could do that one time and have it done, you probably should have just grown up and forgotten it. If you really have to forgive, it is way too big for one time to be enough. Or 20, or 50. That might be the reality in your first day of choosing to let God take responsibility. Here's how it works in practice. When you remember what was done to you, and the emotions well up because they're still fresh. You say, God, that's your problem. You saw what was done to me. It was evil. It was sinful. It was wrong. I didn't deserve that. But it's your problem. I'm going to let you handle it however you choose to. And then when you think of it again, right? God, I've taken responsibility for something I gave to you. I'm giving it back. And it may be 20 times or 50 times in the very first day you choose to forgive. But the day will come when you realize it's been hours now since I thought of that situation. I've begun to heal. The wound is beginning to diminish in intensity. And then pretty soon, it's been days or even weeks since I felt the pain from that betrayal that happened in my past. And one day, just maybe, as God works, it'll be years since that's affected you. When you've been wounded, when the wound heals, you'll still have a scar. You can't forget, but the pain no longer has to be fresh. And God restores hope. You can entrust justice to him. You don't have to be someone who stays on that cycle of, I got to even the score. I can't forget. I got to figure out a way to get revenge. You just simply say, the creator of the universe said he'll handle this for me. That's his problem. So I want to pray for you, because it is not easy to do. It's freeing, it's healing, it's powerful, but it isn't easy. So let me pray. Lord, you know us. You know every detail of every experience we've walked through. Lord, as we think about ways other people have wounded us, betrayed us, offended us, hurt us, abused us, Lord, I pray that you'd help us turn that over to you and experience the freedom and the hope and the healing that can come by your spirit as 
You take care of whatever was done on our behalf. Lord, I pray that we'd be able to trust your justice, that we'd act in faith in that way. And we'd turn it over to you and leave it there and then keep turning it over to you when we realize we've picked it back up. Lord, I pray for those who have been trying to forgive, that they'd see progress, that the time between the moments they recall the offense would get longer and longer and that the pain would diminish as you bring healing. Thank you for what you do by your grace. In Jesus' precious name, amen.